Hello. Welcome to the fifth Museum Talks from the UK at Istanbul Modern. We started the program in December and we will have hosted eight Museum Talks by mid-April. All by prominent museum professionals from leading art institutions in the UK. First, I'd like to acknowledge the invaluable collaboration of our partner, British Consul, and all the guest speakers who have been very generous to share their expertise on various areas, including museum management, museum collections, digital technologies, audience development, expansion projects, etc. Tonight, we are especially delighted to present a lecture on museum education. As you would know, Istanbul Modern is dedicated not only to the collection and exhibition of artworks, but to fulfill a social and educational role. We have a mission to engage different audiences with modern and contemporary visual culture, both inside and outside of the museum building. Our education and social projects department tries to provide an education and collaborative platform for museum visitors, artists, and other art and educational professionals. Uh, for this, we have built partnerships, sustainable collaborations with local and cent central governments, as well as the private sector and the NGOs. And we have reached almost 600,000 children, young people, and adults um, since the opening of the museum. To talk on museum education tonight, the museum education today and tomorrow, we invited a dear colleague from the British Museum, known as the first national public museum in the world and a top visitor attraction by its remarkable collection that covers more than two million years of history and culture. Jane Findlay is with us tonight. She is the head of schools and young audiences, and she will mainly focus on digital learning in her pr presentation. She will give examples from British Museum's sustainable partnerships on technology, augmented reality applications in the galleries to engage audiences and families, um, online teaching resources, etc. Um, but before I invite uh, Jane, I'd like to invite the director of British Council Turkey, Margaret Jack, who will also make an introduction. And I'm sure she has a few words on the significance of education in the UK, given the long time commitment of the British Council in the educational programs. So please, Margaret. Thank you. Well, Thank you very much, Chelling Hanam Chok Saolun, Ian Iak Shamlar Hershechin. Good evening. This is actually the first public event we've had as a cultural organization since we all received very sad news on Friday. And I'd just like, firstly, if I may, here at our partner, Istanbul Modern, um, to say on behalf of the British Council to express our condolences to the family and the people of Turkey for the passing of Yashar Kemal, a literary giant and a man of great courage and strong principle. So thank you for giving us the platform and opportunity to express this uh, this evening. I actually first came across his work in the late 1970s when I was preparing to take up my first post with the British Council here in Turkey in Ankara, in fact. And at that time, Turkey was little known and even less understood internationally. And it was very hard for a reader like me, without a knowledge of the Turkish language at the time, to find books other than history books and academic treatises which actually shed light on Turkey. So for me, as for millions of readers around the world, it was actually, it was Yashar Kemal's vivid stories born out of Anatolia and translated into English by his wife, Thilda, which captured the imagination and brought to life the richness of Turkey's diversity and culture while never shying away from the challenges of social injustice. 
While we mourn the loss of Yashar Kamal in these days, we can take great heart, however, that he opened the way for the voices of many more contemporary writers from Turkey to be heard and published now in a multitude of languages for the enjoyment of readers around the world. A fantastic legacy. So moving on now, we welcome you again to the fifth talk, as, as uh, Chelenk Hanum has said, in the series Museums Talk from the UK. And it's with our excellent partners, Istanbul Modern. And as part of the British Council's commitment to offering international opportunities across Turkey and our commitment to education for all, um, this talk is being repeated tomorrow in Bursa with our partners, the Bursa Metropolitan Municipality, Bursa Belediye, and it is being videoed for digital viewers and those who wish to refresh or catch up on talks in the series. As, as you may know, with talks from the UK, we're always looking at new ideas that are worth sharing, new models for exploring and encouraging international collaborations. And in the last two talks, with Chris Durkin, director of Tate Modern, and with David Anderson, director of the National Museums of Wales, we looked at rethinking museums as social spaces, as public institutions, and we speculated on how the future of museums will look. But interestingly enough, we've also heard from Tate Modern and the National Museums of Wales about their ambitious plans and their commitment to education and learning at the museums. And we've seen the investments they're making to create large, free access social spaces specifically for the purposes of education and learning. So museums offer a huge resource which is relevant to and can support inspiration and learning in its very widest sense for everyone. And today, museum education has become one of the most important aspects of museum development. As Chris Durkin suggested, it will even become an artistic activity in its own right in the near future. Now, when we talk about rethinking museums, finding new ways of engagement, unlocking resources and the future, digital technologies inherently come into the conversation. And no more so is this relevant than here in Turkey, one of the most digitally savvy and connected countries in the world. The whole waves of new media, uh, web media, applications, widgets, iPads, smart devices, mean young people, parents, all of us, are being bombarded in every waking hour by bits and bytes and data coming often as, not as information as knowledge, but coming as floods of white stuff at us. And we're being drawn into a digital world of what has been called the nether, the nether world, a world where it's about everything and it's about nothing. And we need more ever in that context, the chance for self-reflection, to think about the world and our place in it, to have a lot of this data, this information curated for us in a way that makes sense to us, and for the opportunity to develop the creative life skills we all need, and particularly our young people need, to prosper both as individuals and as communities. And this is where museums can play a vital role. And so that's why I'd now like to hand over to Jane Finley to tell us more about the British Museum's unique digital learning program. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. And please enjoy your evening. Çok teşekkürler. Sağ olun. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm delighted to be welcomed here today by the British Council and Istanbul Modern. Um, my name is Jane Findlay, and I'm the head of schools and young audiences at the British Museum. 
Today I'm going to be talking about um, digital learning and what it can do for our audiences. So I'm going to give you a bit of context and background about digital learning at the British Museum. Um, and then I'm going to talk about our flagship partnership with Samsung, uh, who are a technology partner, and give you some examples of the different ways in which we use digital technology to really enhance our learning programs. So I'm going to look at blended learning, augmented reality, and online learning. So before I start that, I thought I'd just do a brief introduction about myself and the, the museum and how our team really fits within that organization. So I've been working in um, museum education for around nine years now. Um, prior to the British Museum, I was working at Kenwood House, which is a historic property um, with an, an old master's art collection in Hampstead Heath in London. Before that, I worked at the National Maritime Museum in Greenwich, and before that, the London Transport Museum in Covent Garden. So I've really worked on very varied collections from social history through to art to history proper, um, and of, also in, on different scales and sizes of institutions. Um, my, my real passions are in um, reinterpretation, how we can um, work with our audiences to understand the significance of our collections and what they mean today and how they help inform our identity. And also, which I'll touch more on um, what is the kind of the, the bones of this um, presentation, digital participation. I'm fascinated with how technology changes the way we interact with one another, um, both socially, through the way we communicate, and I think museums have, um, it offers very many exciting potential uh, opportunities for museums to really harness this new technology and use it to better engage our audiences. So I'll move on to the museum. I've been there since 2014. So still fairly new, and I'm sure it doesn't need that much of an introduction, but I'll give you a few kind of facts anyway. So, so the museum was founded in 1753, and really it presents the history of the world for the world um, with a collection that spans over two million years. Um, we are the top visit attraction in the UK and the second in the world to only the Louvre. Um, and recently, UK museums have seen a, quite a surge in, in visitor figures, really, um, over the last two years. Um, the national galleries and Tate, in particular, have seen their international audiences grow. And museums, such as our museum, have seen both their international and national audiences is grow. Um, and this, is, this has been brilliant. For us, um, it means we have um, huge numbers of visitors coming through the, the doors every day. Um, and really, what we're looking to do at the museum is to tell the stories behind our objects in ways that really resonate with our visitors who come from all over the world. So learning really is at the heart of what we do. It's how people get access to our collections. It's how they um, re relate and respond to our collections. So moving on to our team, I manage the schools and families, families team. Um, we sit within the learning, volunteer and audiences department. There are a thousand people who work at the museum and 50 work in education. So as you can see, it's quite a big scale um, team. Um, my specific team counts nine members of staff. Um, and a, a wide team of freelancers and facilitators who also support us to teach and meet different audiences' needs. Um, the schools program um, welcomes over a quarter of a million um, students um, every year, um, and we cover a very broad age, range of ages too, so from our early years foundation students who are from four up to our A-level students or our key stage five students who are 18. And we offer not only taught workshops but an increasing amount of self-led experiences too that range from things that people can download from our website through to packs of resources that people can collect from our education centre and use to take around with them. And more increasingly digital resources too, but I'll get on to a bit more of that later. 
Um, our families program is also fairly substantial. We offer activities every weekend, um, digital workshops, and we also offer activities in every holiday, so Christmas holidays, Easter holidays, our half-term holidays um, for families in our, all our spaces, in our great court, in our galleries, and they can be very varied from kind of art and craft workshops to music and dance to storytelling and all responding to either our core collections or our temporary exhibitions. One thing that's really important for our team is that we work across audiences. So our education managers work with both schools and families um, rather than just on one specific audience. We also have a number of specialist programs, such as our um, special education needs program for families and schools, um, and our financial education um, program, which is a funded program through Citibank. So, digital learning. What do we mean when we say digital learning? We talk about it in a very broad sense. We define it as any use of technology that facilitates learning. So that could be something that you look at on a website online. It could be something that you use your own mobile at the museum. It could be something where you borrow a device or use our digital learning suite. And the reason we have a broad definition is for flexibility. Technology is, is changing at a rapid, rapid pace. And by being um, broad about the kind of technology that we'll use, it means that we always pick which is m the technology that is most appropriate for our audience, um, as opposed to whatever's coming latest. Um, it's also important to note that for UK, UK museums, we have a very broad definition also of learning. So we look at it in a very wide sense. So it's alongside knowledge acquisition. It's all about also about gaining skills, changing attitudes, um, different approaches and behaviors um, to things, looking at things differently, um, and creativity as well. So it's very broad. And in the way we evaluate and, and um, measure of the impact of our programs, we um, look at this whole spectrum of learning. So to give you some strategic background and how digital learning sits um, for our team, the um, learning volunteers and audiences department has recently signed off on a new strategy. Um, and that strategy aims to increase the reach of our programs, to deepen the engagement of our programs, to advocate for our our programs and our audiences, and to be a sustainable and resilient department. And really, we see te um, digital technology as a, a key part in, in achieving this new strategy. So, for example, in terms of increasing reach, with our video conferencing sessions, we're able to beam into schools across the country internationally too, as opposed to the limited numbers of, say, 30 people who can come to take part in one workshop. Um, Digital technology also offers ways of layering interpretation um, and therefore enables you to deepen engagement with people who want to go further and deeper into content. Um, advocacy too um, can be facilitated through technology. Um, through social channels, our audiences are really becoming our advocates for us and they, their word of mouth is really harnessed by technology. And finally, through partnerships such as working with Samsung and efficiencies around digital technology, we're able to maintain a sustainable program. So it has a lot of um, kind of contribution to our wider strategy. And I'd say with digital learning, it's really important that you are part of your, your learning strategy. So you don't sit apart from it, but you're fully integrated within it. We also have a lot of changes taking place with our digital team at the museum. The whole department has been reorganized and we had 22 new people start the other week. So um, rapid and big changes going there. Um, and for us, it's been really important to integrate with their strategy too. So we kind of knit ours to theirs. Um, you can see already there's overlap in that they're also aiming to increase the museum's reach so we can help with that but also they're looking at understanding um, all that data that we're emitting as audiences to better meet their needs. And this for us is, is really important um, in our learning programs too. It would be brilliant to be able to understand how many people are downloading a particular resource, which is the, how far they're getting through our website, what are the pieces of content that they're most interested in. 
And finally, they're looking as a department at developing new revenue schemes, which can again support our learning objectives too. So moving on to our flagship partnership with Samsung. Um, I thought I'd give you some background before I get into the specifics of the different types of um, digital learning. The partnership really is kind of at the heart of our digital learning offer, and we'd have a very, very limited program without it. Um, and we're in our second um, phase of five years of uh, five-year funding, so it will run until 2019. And um, with that funding, we are able to have um, a our Samsung Digital Discovery Center, which is a digital classroom effectively in the museum, which is fully kitted out with um, technical equipment, the latest Samsung um, technology, and also is refreshed every, um, every, so few, every few years. We also have two full-time um, learning managers who run our digital learning offer. So as you can see, it, comes, um, it provides us with a, a whole range of ways um, that we can do digital learning. And it's been really important um, for the museum. Importantly for Samsung too, we are their, seen as their flagship cultural partner, and this is something that we're keen to develop together. I think what really for me, um, this relationship has kind of gone from strength to strength. And, and really, it's about, um, we found kind of being clear about which, what each other needs and having a really good dialogue throughout the partnership. Um, and that has been enabled us to work together closely to make sure we always know which, what each other is trying to get out of the partnership, but also how we can hone and refine what we're doing together, be that through incorporating new technology or looking at how um, it supports our other programs and activities in the museum. So for example, we're now using some of the Samsung um, sessions to look at how we work with our community's partnership team and the work they do with supplementary schools. But for me, what's really um, the strength in this partnership is that the, f the freedom that the Samsung and the trust that we, they have with the, our team. So they never dictate what we're going to teach. We have complete control of our program. We ensure that it fits with our collections, with our audiences, that it's um, the highest quality education work that we would like to do. Um, and we also always make sure that we're not just using technology for learning for tech's sake. It's always with a learning um, driving that technology and that use of technology. So, for example, at the moment, um, Samsung have a new uh, virtual reality headset. Um, and we're working really closely with them to understand how that would work best in a historic heritage context. Um, and that's been really uh, lovely because we've been put in touch with different technology partners um, and are really making a lovely rich offer for our audiences, um, which is actually quite new in museums. When we were looking initially at the research, um, there's not been there's not that much being done about VR in a, a museum context, so we're looking to kind of lead the way with that, um, with Samsung. And just to give you a, an idea of the scale that we're looking at, um, on a year basis, we see, we see around 10,000 children and families coming through the center. It's a seven day a week program of taught and self-led activities. So um, it's a pretty substantial part of our learning offer. So I'm gonna move on to the different types of technology that I'm gonna focus on today. So I'm gonna talk about blended learning, augmented reality, and online learning. Blended learning it's really at the heart of all Samsung um, SDDC sessions. And really it's about using, using technology as a tool alongside other traditional teaching methods. And it's really about choosing the technology which will best amplify the activities and learning outcomes of your session. Um, and thinking about how de technology works um, and what it can support learning. We know that it does some things really well. So for example, collaboration. If you ever see in students around a tablet, you'll see how effective that is at getting them to work together. 
Personalization is another strength of digital technology. We talk a lot about personalization in education and we're getting a lot more of a sense from our tough teachers that people want to be able to personalize and tailor sessions for their students depending on their ability. And digital is a great way of, of doing that. It also um, can really help with social skills. Um, depending on how you use it, it can help you use social media safely, but it also can help um, encourage students to share and collaborate. And creativity. Digital technology has a, a wonderful, powerful way of being able to create something then and there, which we found has really engaged students. Um, so when you're thinking about blending learning, it's about identifying the, the technology that will work hardest for you. And sometimes it could just be you're using one type of technology. It could be so simple, something using a, a trail, adding a digital camera to capture the things that you're trying to find around the museum and then coming back and, and looking at those images together. But in other instances, it could be using multiple forms of technology and kind of combining them. So it's really about finding what works best for the learning. And I think what's also really, really key with blended learning is that technology is used where it enhances learning, not just because it's the latest thing. So it never takes over from the teaching and the learning, and it's never a substitute for teaching, but something that enhances. Often technology gets a, a kind of bad reputation for being a distraction, and the fear being that if you put a camera or a phone in front of a young person, that's all they're going to focus on. Um, but by keeping it in a framework um, in the same way you would design any learning session, it becomes a help and not a hindrance. So I'm going to give you some examples now of sessions that we run, blended learning sessions. So this one is called Multimedia Magic. Um, and it's about students exploring um, our China and Asia galleries um, with um, a variety of different um, pieces of technology. They start off with an uh, introduction, which is facilitated by our educators, um, context as to why they're there, and those big inquiry questions that they're going to try and answer in the session together. And then they use um, digital cameras, um, voice recorders, tablets to capture the gallery and the information that they're interested in. They work together in groups, and then they come back together at the end of the session to the SDDC and create an interactive presentation. Um, and this is great because, again, it's, it's using collaboration. It allows the students to drive that learning within the gallery space. They're responding to the things that, that resonate with them. And it also helps them to crystallize their learning then and there by creating something together. And when they go back to the classroom, it frees up the teacher to spend that time doing more in-depth information and, and building on what, on what they've learned. And, and as you can see, it's blending very much analog and um, with the digital there. There's a lovely picture of this girl posing in front of one of our Buddha statues and the photo being taken. So it's very much a, an analog and digital blend. The next session um, is Greek temples. Now, this is the other end of the spectrum. So this, I feel, is looking at using a lot of different types of technology. So in this um, session, our educators talk to the students about um, Greek temples through a presentation, which is done on an e-board. This all takes place within our SDDC center. Um, once they've had their presentation, um, they then use polling software to see um, what they've understood and also then to democratically vote as a class as to what kind of temple they're going to create. Um, they then use uh, tablets and interactive spreadsheets to help actually build those, temp those temples and think about the kind of constraints that people would have been under when they were building them. So they're given a budget, so they've got to face the reality of how you create a temple, um, the temple that you want to create um, with constraints, um, and experience the same questions. And as you can imagine, this prompts a lot of discussion around the students, um, and also really um, helps them to kind of think through um, the different materials that they would have used, the different decorations, and um, the different kind of labor as well that went into creating temples. 
Um, there are also nice touches um, where they, um, which also um, help them to use more technology. So they use, we scan QR codes for them to um, give them more information about their temples. And again, it allows students who are quicker than others or are more advanced to keep going further and they can spend that time building more temples, um, whereas other students who are working at a slower pace, they can take their time as well. So it allows that kind of personalization that I was talking about, um, and that's another great asset of digital. So I'd say if you're looking at blended learning, the best um, way to do it is to start small and build up. Maybe just introduce one type of technology that you can um, into a session and, and see how it works. Um, test it, test what works for your audience. All the sessions that we do, we go through a piloting session, a piloting phase, where we're working with our schools, our friendly schools that we have a good relationship with, um, and we'll try things out and see how they work and hone and refine. And then we keep working on them as well. So when the sessions are running, we'll keep developing them too. And that helps us to incorporate new technology as well um, into sessions. So they're not something that's fixed and then left. They're growing and living kind of sessions. Okay, so we're going to move on now to augmented reality. We have um, at the museum a, a really long uh, kind of history of working with augmented reality. Um, and Shelley Mannion, uh, um, who is in our digital team, has talked um, internationally about our experiences of this, um, we feel it's a really, really powerful tool um, that enables our visitors to look closer, um, to add layers of information to our objects, and to, to particularly give that in-depth interpretation. We've also noticed that more and more so, we're seeing visitors coming with their own devices, sometimes attached to a selfie stick, sometimes not, but they're here with their mobiles, with their tablets, and there's definitely a demand for them to use those in a way that helps them engage with the collections. Um, and it's something that we've done a lot of research on and we will continue to do so. We're building up a bank of understanding around this technology. So, so this is our latest um, augmented reality device. It's called GIF for Athena um, and it's an app an app that is downloaded by families to, uh, to their mobile or tablet, um, and it's for them to use to explore the Parthenon galleries. We developed it um, in partnership with a, uh, a local London startup actually called Gamer. Um, and the reason this worked well for us is that it gave us the, the flexibility of working very closely with a small team. Um, on a very iterative process, and also access to their specialism. So they specialize in using augmented reality in heritage sites. So they've worked in a lot of different London sites, such as the Cutty Sark, and we were able to harness that through, through working with them. So once a family has downloaded uh, the app, they use the GameR platform to download it, um, they launch a game. And this game is really hung around a series of mini games or challenges that they would work through together to unlock content. And as they work through um, the games and challenges, they start to see different things around the um, sculptures. Um, and this helps them really to, to look much more closely and more deeply at that object. They can start to discern the different figures, what's happening, what their significance is in the um, object, and also try to understand the different meanings and the different definitions around things. So they're learning about ancient Greek architecture, they're learning about mythology, but in a very interactive and fun way. We don't shy away from not talking about pediments or metopes, that's still all in there, but it's just delivered in a very different way. Um, and it really helps them to take the camera beyond a lens, all the time in the museum, we see people taking pictures of objects, and this allows you to go further than that, so beyond just using it uh, as a camera. We spent a lot of time developing it. It wasn't a quick project. Uh, it took over 12 months, um, working very closely um, with families and school groups of different ages to test out the content. So 
this helped us to really make sure we made something that worked for these audiences. The process was iterative, as I mentioned, so there was lots of paper prototyping, lots of trialing different things very quickly in the galleries and seeing what worked and what didn't. Um, and this enabled us to, to change things as we went along and to, to kind of test our assumptions constantly in developing that app. Um, we also decided to make it um, available for families on both iOS and Android platforms so that it's cross-platform. And we also discovered that actually it worked really well for school groups as well. So now, as well as just families being able to use it, in the galleries, we also have it as a session that schools can come and use as a self-led resource. So now we are enabling schools to borrow our note tablets and go and explore the galleries for a 45-minute session um, together. And it puts the teacher in the driving seat um, with that session. And, and more and more, that's what we're looking to do, to use technology to enable those self-led visits. Um, as I was saying, we have a very busy program, and at the moment we're at capacity in terms of our spaces. Um, we can't get more physic people physically into those spaces, so digital really helps us to, um, to, to meet more people and to, to make our um, spaces even more accessible, and to still provide a high-quality experience for our school groups as well, even if they are being taught or being self-led. Um, I, I like this quote as um, it just shows that um, the game really opens people's eyes to the, to the sculptures. And our evaluation also really attests to the fact that it, it is helping people to, to do that too. So the next stop for us with augmented reality um, is to build on this. Um, we're doing another collaboration with GameR. Um, looking at making another app, an augmented reality app, which explores our early Egyptian collections. Um, and that's going to be themed around animals and climate change. So again, very relevant, very accessible topics for families, um, but as ways to help them understand that period of history. And that's kind of in the testing phase at the moment. So I saw lots of family is testing it this week um, and last week because it was half term and we had loads of people. Um, the next thing for schools is really about thinking um, about our religious studies offer. Um, we have a small religious studies offer, but the collection really lends itself to supporting world religion. So we're looking at developing uh, an augmented reality app called Digital Islam um, to engage students of religious studies with our Islamic galleries, which are a quite quiet gallery and not as well used as um, we'd like them to be for secondary schools. Um, and then also to build on that and to create a, a suite of um, a AR apps for um, religions of the world. And again, add to that self-led exploration. And finally, um, we're working as well closely with our digital team, who are also looking at developing um, products and devices for for families and visitors. Um, families are one of their key areas that they'd like to work on and we're really pleased about that and happy to work with them. Um, and we're looking at using, uh, creating some more content really for bring your own devices. Um, and one of the ways um, at the moment we're looking at is um, talking statues. So can we animate our statues? Can they talk to you and tell you things using augmented reality? when you go around? Can that be a way that families orientate and work their way through the museum? Because it's so big and so um, it's quite intense and it's quite overwhelming when you first come. So we look to help our families through different resources and we have paper resources of trails um, and, and backpacks, but digital can take us further as well. So there are many exciting things that we'll be looking forward to doing with augmented reality um, and our families. Okay, I'm going to move on to our online resource um, program. So we've been using online resources for a long time, and museums, I think, have been using them for many years now to connect with teachers. And I think we're all starting to see, see clear trends in what UK teachers want and what they're looking for for digital resources. So we know that teachers are busier than ever with timetable constraints, marking, um, so they're time poor. 
So they need to know what this resource is and who it's for and how it's going to meet their needs very quickly. Um, so it's really important that that information is very uh, clear for teachers and they're not having to click through many links. And at the moment, we're looking at redeveloping our website and we're going to be using this kind of learning and understanding to better shape it. Um, we also know that um, it's important that that resource gets to teachers in through many different ways. So our website is one way, but also it's important to seed it to different other other websites where they're going to be searching for and looking for things. So going to them as well as them just coming to us. So for example, we have TES, which is a website that lots and lots of teachers use. So it's about being there and making our resources available there where they're looking for other um, resources. We also know that there are certain formats that teachers like, and these have changed over time, but at the moment, um, we know that, for example, smart boards are pretty ubiquitous in um, UK schools, so everyone's got an electronic smart board, so we really need to make sure that the resources that we offer are optimised for that platform. On the other hand, tablets are growing um, in schools, and we see more and more schools having those that kind of devices, um, but it's not everywhere. So it's about really understanding the context and what schools are working with. Um, it's very varied, so um, it's just important to keep talking with schools. And we use um, an online panel of teachers that we consult about our resources, and this this really helps us to kind of to keep abreast of of that. Um, in terms of our content, we also are starting to understand as well the ways that teachers want that information. So they want to have the most important things at the top and then more in-depth information um, as they work down throughout the resource. So that kind of inverted triangle approach, very much in the way that web content does. So when you're developing a resource, those curriculum links, those key topics and themes, really important to have right at the top rather than at the bottom buried. But really, it's just about talking to your audience and really knowing what they need. So that dialogue, be it online, be it in person, and that testing of a resource is really key to making a good online resource. So um, very recently, well, a year ago, um, the UK history curriculum changed quite dramatically. Um, we have a, uh, the former um, Secretary of Education, Michael Gove, introduced a very different curriculum, um, which was a chronological syllabus and took away many of the topics that a lot of museums had covered um, in the primary curriculum. Um, so it looked much more at, so uh, schools went from being able to teach topics such as from as really varied topics from the ancient Egypt to the Tudors to World War II. Um, at primary age to only having a period from the Stone Age to 1066 to cover. Um, and naturally, this was a big shift for teachers. And for many of them, they were um, nervous about teaching these areas of, the areas of the curriculum, which they just didn't have the knowledge of or the experience of. Um, and what we saw as, was an opportunity to support them, because the British Museum collections um, span this period. We cover this whole period of history and therefore we could offer support to teachers in helping them to um, deliver this new curriculum. So we partner with the Department for Education um, to create a resource called Teaching History in 100 Objects. So it riffs on the history of the world in 100 Objects series that Neil McGregor, our director, did, which has been hugely successful and powerful. Um, I think we've surpassed 35 million downloads now um, on iTunes. Um, but our 100 objects, uh, 60 of them come from uh, the British Museum, and 40 come from our UK partners. So actually different museums across the UK. And what we really wanted to do here was to help um, museums ac across the country, but also really to help schools to know that there's, those museums are there as a resource for them and somewhere they, they can use. And really, as a museum, we work very closely and extensively with our with national partners, um, so it fitted really well um, in with, with that strategy to continue to, to build and su our support for our national um, partners. So the um, 
resources, there are 100, they're free, um, they're all, and they all link to very specific elements of the curriculum. So you can look at key stage one, two, three, a particular topic you're studying, um, and find an object that will support you. Or you can go in from looking at which object you're interested in and finding out where in the curriculum that sits. The resources are developed in a way that the content is layered in terms of depth. It's very um, cleanly laid out. Every object has that same kind of pattern, um, which helps um, teachers to understand how to use the resource and to learn quickly where they'll find the information that they need. Um, it also focuses very much on object-led inquiry skills. Um, at the museum, um, it's really important to us that we're a center of excellence for um, object-led inquiry and object um, teaching around objects. So this again fits very, fits, fits very much with that strategy. Um, and we now this is just the start really. The resources are all there. From January, they, the 100 um, objects went live. Um, and we're working now to really evaluate that as well and to test it with our users to see how they're using it, how schools are using it in classrooms and how we can build on that for the future. So I'll give you some examples of what they what they are and what they look like. So this is a flower barrel. Um, it was sent from the US to the north of England during the Civil War, um, which is at a time when restrictions on cotton trade had actually caused famine in the UK. And this object looks at the themes of, of trade, of uh, the lives of the industrial poor, and also that, that tension between economic and moral decisions. Um, and as you can see on the side, um, okay, I guess features to point out for the, on the website are we have a very large image, again, looking at how we can support students using a whiteboard and having a lovely big image that they can look at together. And also we've got those four categories of information there about the object, which tells you the kind of the nuts and bolts of the object, things you need to know, a bigger picture, which provides context and different videos and access to links that you can look to further research the object, teaching ideas, which just offer kind of some initial starting points for you to explore that object with your student and for the classroom, the things you can do in the classroom to, together. And this is another object. So this is the state entry into Delhi. It's from Bristol Museums. Um, and this is uh, an image of King Edward VII and Queen Alexandra as emperor and, em emperor and empress of India. The object really talks about uh, British Empire and their role in India, which is a key topic for secondary students. Um, but it also brings to mind the fragility of this and questions at the time that were being raised about uh, the nature and the, the reasons behind imperial rule imperial rule. So again, it just prompts different ways that you can use an object to inquire around these topics. And you can also see a couple more of the features of the site there. So um, you can download the uh, file as a whole, as a PDF, so you can take that resource away. Uh, you can sh email it, so share it to with another teacher um, in your school. Or, and so, and that's an area that we're looking as well to grow. So how can we make these more shareable? Can we add social buttons as well to individual objects as well as the site? Um, and again, that's something that we will iterate and refine as we go on. Um, we have a, a strong Google Analytics um, metric for um, this site, which we'll be using to hone and shape the content. Okay, so finally, what is the future for technology and digital learning at the museum? Well, we definitely see it as a big part of our future. Um, and we aim to keep as flexible and agile enough to respond to new developments in technology and more importantly the, the impact it has on, on all our lives and, and the way we interact with one another. Specifically, um, we're looking at um, some key trends. So, um, as I said, mentioned virtual reality. What could that do? Could that could that give you a context to be able to walk through some of the places where our objects come from? Um, and also wearable technology, which is a new uh, kind of area, how we could use um, smart watches and to enhance learning 
and collaboration in the galleries. Um, we also have a few of the new products from our digital um, media team rolling out soon. So at the moment, we have a, a very traditional um, multimedia guide, and this is being redone, but it offers many exciting possibilities for family learning. So that's another area of, the, um, of technology that we'll be looking at, and particularly how um, mobiles um, have a big uh, role to play in our visitor experience. And as a team, we're also looking to build our computer programming offer. Programming is something that is now very much a part of our curriculum, and there's a more, um, more of a demand for um, students and young people to really understand how things work, not only how we can use stuff, but actually how to develop stuff, how to build a program. And that's something that we're very interested in and looking at, at supporting at the museum. And finally, we would like to make bigger scale digital learning um, ex events to help in, in our great court to raise the profile of, of our programs and all the things that we do. So things like having a, a scanathon, a 3D scanathon, or a virtual reality um, booth in our uh, great court would offer ways of demonstrating to, to our visitors just, just what we can do with technology in the museum. So lots of things ahead. Um, I think it's an exciting time for the museum with the new digital team, with the way technology is changing. Um, and yeah, so we're just very much looking forward to seeing what happens next. But I, for sure, it's definitely a part of what we'll be doing now and in the future. OK, that's my presentation um, at an end. Um, I'm very happy to take <laughs> the sign. <laughs> um, I'm really happy to take any questions now that anyone has, or you can talk to me after. Um, whatever works best, really. Oh, okay. Yeah, sure. Oh, we've got some roving mics. <laughs> What would you say your most successful learning program was with kids? And mm. how did you determine that? What were your indicators <laughs> that it was successful with respect to learning? I think really the GIF for Athena is probably our, probably our most, so the augmented reality app is probably our most um, kind of effective piece of digital learning, which worked for families and for schools, because of the way that it helped people to look at the object. And that for us was, came through as really a very powerful learning outcome in a way that other things just hadn't in that space. So I think for me, that's where digital really came in into it, its own for that audience. And the responses that we got from the evaluation really showed that those, that was coming through. So for me, that's a really successful how one. Did you, how did you evaluate? Um, we use a different variety of methods, really. Some sort of more quantitative stuff, so kind of scales of 1 to 10, how did you feel going in, how did you feel coming out, but also those more in-depth interviews, so chatting with, with students, chatting with teachers to get their, res their responses to, and it was kind of triangulating those different types of data to get to um, the kind of outcomes that we wanted to measure. Thank you very much for your speech. Um, I'm interested in the qualities of the people who work in the museum for uh, this area, especially mm -hmm. technology. You said 20 new people are oh. hired. <laughs> but okay. yeah, in the digital so what team. Are the qualities and in what way are they related to psychology, so social psychology? Okay, so um, the new people have joined the digital team. Um, and they're slightly separate to our learning team, but they come from very different and varied backgrounds, really, and I think it's those different, but all come from a very audience-centered um, way of working. So some people come from sort of our media, part, media kind of organizations, other people come from developers, data, and analysts, but they all really care about how a user works with technology and what that user's journey is through digital. For our team, our digital learning officers um, come from a, a museum education background. So they're trained in that kind of pedagogy and um, museum education and how we facilitate learning in a museum context. But they also um, 
are very comfortable working with digital technology. They're not techies in the sense, and in the same way that I'm not in, you know, I couldn't build a program or develop an app, but I understand how it could work, and I understand um, the way that that project is put together. Um, and I also understand how do people different interact with different technology. So, but it's more it's come through as a passion for them and specialism that they've developed over time, um, rather than going through a particular course. Thank you. May I ask one more question? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, you talked about the changes in teaching history. Yes. What, what type of changes are taking place in S teaching history? Th just a, a sort of different, a shift in focus. So um, it's a broader period of history. So you know, guess from pre prehistory up to modern day, and you work through that kind of through the different um, key stages. And also, it's a much more of a knowledge focus shift. So rather than a skills of historical inquiry, it's more about a knowledge base and inquiring that knowledge and that chronological understanding as well as that historical inquiry. But that that seems to be the, the biggest shift. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Oh. Are your programs uh, free of charge for all uh, the people who want to come since you have supporters? Yeah, yes, they are. Um, and that's a, another way of us, a brilliant way for us to increase access to our programs is that they, all these programs are from the SDDC are funded for free for our schools and our families. Yeah. Okay, I think that's all the questions then. Um, thank you very much. Oh, sorry, one more. Okay. <laughs> Yes, yes, we do. We have a, a video conferencing um, program. This is something that we've just started and are, are looking to build on as well. But we have one uh, session which is called, um, so if I get the right title for it now, uh, Treasure Challenge, Roman Treasure Challenge, which is um, a video conferencing where you, you um, dial into it and you meet an archaeologist and you work through um, a, a hoard that they found together asking those questions that an archaeologist would and that's something that they and they ask they can ask you interact um, with the person who's running this the archaeologist who's delivering the session but it's something that schools access from their classroom as well yeah no that's a that's a virtual visit so yeah yeah okay okay great thank you very much for your time <laughs>